Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing my review of The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. So this is number, I want to say seven, yeah, number seven in the Wizard of Oz series. I read this as a buddy read with Joel Swogman. We've been going through and reading all of the Wizard of Oz books uh, as a series of buddy reads. As always, I'm going to go ahead and read you the blurb. Uh, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... When Scraps, the patchwork girl, is brought to life with the crooked magician's magic powder, a terrible accident turns Ojo's uncle to marble. The quest to find the special ingredients for the antidote leads Scraps and Ojo into an extraordinary escapades, but all the friends of Oz are there to lend a helping hand along the way. So we'll go into some tabs. I want to start out with uh, the prologue, and um, basically this is L. Frank Baum explaining uh, how this story came about. So at the end of the last book, Oz was cut off from the rest of the world. And he writes, The children who had learned to look for the books about Oz and who loved the stories about the gay and happy people inhabiting that favoured country were as sorry as their historian that there would be no more books of Oz stories. They wrote many letters asking if the historian did not know of some adventures to write about that had happened before the land of Oz was shut out from all the rest of the world. But he did not know of any. Finally, one of the children inquired why we couldn't hear from Princess Dorothy by wireless telegraph, which would enable her to communicate to the historian whatever happened in the far-off land of Oz, without his seeing her or even knowing just where Oz is. That seemed a good idea, so the historian rigged up a high tower in his backyard and took lessons in wireless telegraphy until he understood it, and then began to call Princess Dorothy of Oz by sending messages into the air. And, um, basically Shaggy Man knows how to rig up a telegraph set, not explained how. And uh, she receives a message and tells him this story. We have a glass cat in this story uh, who has pink brains uh, that you can see through the glass as well. And so they um, they use this like magic powder to bring the patchwork girl to life. And we learn a little bit about um, what she looks like, I guess. So we get Ojo says, what is a patchwork quilt? A bed quilt made of patches of different kinds and colours of cloth, all neatly sewed together. The patches are of all shapes and sizes, so a patchwork quilt is a very pretty and gorgeous thing to look at. Sometimes it is called a crazy quilt, because the patches and colours are so mixed up. We never have used my grandmother's many coloured patchwork quilt, handsome as it is, for we munchkins do not care for any colour other than blue, so it has been packed away in the chest for about a hundred years. When I found it, I said to myself that it would do nicely for my servant girl, for when she was brought to life she would not be proud nor haughty, as the glass cat is, for such a dreadful mixture of colours would discourage her from trying to be as dignified as the blue munchkins are. Is blue the only respectable colour then? inquired Ojo. Yes, for a munchkin. All our country is blue, you know. But in other parts of Oz, the people favour different colours. At the Emerald City, where our Princess Ozma lives, green is the popular colour. But all munchkins prefer blue to anything else. And when my housework girl is brought to life, she will find herself to be of so many unpopular colours that she'll never dare be rebellious or impudent, as servants are sometimes liable to be when they are made the same way their mistresses are. And uh, so we get this little conversation between uh, Unk Nunky, I think Unk Nunky, and, um, oh no, sorry, the magician. Yeah, we get this conversation between the magician and the cat. So the cat goes, who is the dwarf? That is not a dwarf, but a boy, answered the magician. You have never seen a boy before. He is now small because he is young. With more years, he will grow big and become as tall as Unk Nunky. Oh, is that magic? The glass animal inquired. Yes, but it is nature's magic, which is more wonderful than any art known to man. For instance, my magic made you and made you live, and it was a poor job because you are useless and a bother to me, but I can't make you grow. You will always be the same size and the same saucy, inconsiderate glass cat with pink brains and a hard ruby heart. There we get. No one can regret more than I the fact that you made me, asserted the cat, crouching upon the floor and slowly swaying its spun glass tail from side to side. Your world is a very uninteresting place. I've wandered through your gardens and in the forest until I'm tired of it all, and when I come in the house the conversation of your fat wife and of yourself bores me dreadfully. Now, apart from the fat shaming, I just thought I was kind of interested in this. They're quite moribund, isn't it, you know? And then they spill the powder of life on the phonograph, which is a bit of a bummer, because then it comes to life and starts playing music and they can't get it to stop. So they have to get uh, the woozy, who's one of the creatures they meet along the way, they have to get him to get angry, because then his eyes flash fire. And uh, they can do that to burn a hole through these fences. Um, so he says, but I cannot flash fire from my eyes unless I'm very angry. Can't you get angry about something, please? Asked Ojo. I'll try. You just say Krizzle Crew to me. Will that make you angry? inquired the boy. Terribly angry. What does it mean? asked Scraps. I don't know, that's what makes me so angry, replied the woozy. Flawless logic there. But they're going off on this like big old mission 
to get the ingredients they need to turn um, whoever it was that got yeah blah blah turn Ojo's uncle to marble. So they need to get the, these ingredients to make a you know powder of life or whatever to bring him back. And I. I don't understand why they didn't just ask Ozma to wish him back normal with a magic wishing belt. Uh, the Shaggy Man says, uh, take it easy is my motto. If you can't take it easy, take it as easy as you can. So I think it's good advice. And then the Shaggy Man's eating a square meal. Um, I'm not sure if this is referenced in the previous books, but I really like this concept. Uh, my dad actually used to have this, used to say he wished there was a pill he could eat instead, uh, he could take instead of eating because you waste so much time eating. Um, and we get this. Saying this, he took a bottle from his pocket and shook from it a tablet about the size of one of Ojo's fingernails. That, announced the Shaggy Man, is a square meal, in condensed form. Invention of the great Professor Wogglebug of the Royal College of Athletics. It contains soup, fish, roast meat, salad, apple dumplings, ice cream and chocolate drops, all boiled down to this small size, so it can be conveniently carried and swallowed when you are hungry and need a square meal. So my dad would be happy. Uh, the Wogglebug is a character that's sort of previously been in the stories as well. And uh, Ojo is called Ojo the Unlucky and he, he gets uh, in prison because he picks uh, a six, what is it, a six leaf clover, uh, even though it's not allowed. Um, and they chuck him in jail. And he's the first time uh, anybody's had to be jailed. And I just thought, I mean, um, Joel in his videos, I'll link to Joel's channel below, but he's talked a lot about how the books kind of get increasingly like utopian and almost like socialist uh, and communist in nature. Um, but this is kind of a very utopian idea of uh, what jail should be. And actually, it is kind of happening in some places in our world. Um, I think in some of the Scandinavian countries, they do something similar, where they try and make jail a nice place to be, you know? So anyway, we get this. And am I a prisoner? Bless the child, of course. Then why is the prison so fine? And why are you so kind to me? He earnestly asked. Tolly Diggle seemed surprised by the question, but she presently answered. We consider a prisoner unfortunate. He is unfortunate in two ways, because he has done something wrong and because he is deprived of his liberty. Therefore we should treat him kindly because of his misfortune, for otherwise he would become hard and bitter and would not be sorry he had done wrong. Ozma thinks that one who has committed a fault did so because he was not strong and brave. Therefore she puts him in a prison to make him strong and brave. When that is accomplished he is no longer a prisoner, but a good and loyal citizen, and everyone is glad that he is now strong enough to resist doing wrong. You see, it is kindness that makes one strong and brave, and so we are kind to our prisoners. Um, and basically they say like, um, isn't one punished enough in knowing he has done wrong? Don't you wish, Ojo, with all your heart that you had not been disobedient and broken a law of Oz? I, I hate to be different from other people, he admitted. So I don't think that would necessarily work in our world. I'm not even convinced it works in Oz, and he's like the only prisoner that they have. He doesn't really learn a lesson. And so Scraps finds the uh, six-leaf clover because um, Ojo's kind of hidden it in a basket. So uh, Scraps was quick-witted and although she had no heart, she recognised the fact that Ojo was her first friend. She knew at once that because the boy had taken the clover, he had been imprisoned. And she understood that Ojo had given her the basket so they would not find the clover in his possession and have proof of his crime. So turning her head to see that no one noticed her, she took the clover from the basket and dropped it into a golden vase that stood on Dorothy's table. But the thing is, is Ozma saw him pick the, the six-leaf clover because um, Ozma sees all, you know? So wouldn't Ozma have seen that? Food for thought. Uh, and then Ozma recaps the stories of the previous books and how she became ruler and stuff, uh, which I'm not going to go into here. You can watch my older reviews for that if you're interested. And then after uh, Ojo gets out of jail, um, he's talking to Ozma about what he needs. And he's like, well, one of them is a six-leaf clover. And she says, well... You've already got it now, and you've already been punished for that, so you might as well keep it. And uh, they go and see uh, Yoop, who is a, a giant. And I just thought some, some of these lines are just quite funny. They're quite, um, they're very puntastic, you know. So uh, they, they see this. Mr. Yoop, his cave, the largest untamed giant in captivity. Height, 21 feet, and yet he has but two feet. Weight, 1,640 pounds, but he waits all the time. Age, 400 years and up, as they say in the department store advertisements. Temper, fierce and ferocious, except when asleep. Appetite, ravenous, prefers meat people and orange marmalade. So yeah, I think that's about all I wanted to share with you from this one, really. It does very much kind of continue this formula of basically a bit of a road trip, bringing in all of the characters at the end for like a, a recap or whatever. I must admit, I do prefer the ones that just start out following Dorothy and those lot, as opposed to like this one just introduces some new characters and then we kind of see them later on. Um, 
But you know, I mean, Frank, L. Frank Baum's doing all right, considering he must have been starting to run out of ideas by this point, you know. Um, but he does a pretty good job with this. It's entertaining enough. Um, I think kids in particular would love it. And obviously, if you've read to this point in the series, you might as well keep reading. Um, I think uh, the fifth book, I think it was the fifth book, was a low point for me. And a sixth book came back up again. Seven, we're back down a little bit. But uh, overall, still a pre pretty good, um, kind of like a week four out of five. Uh, make of that as you will. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.